Hi, and welcome to our live webinar, Students' Perspectives, Diverse Pathways to Oral Health Education. I'm Dr. Shelvia English, the Senior Director of Access, Diversity, and Inclusion at ADEA, and the Staff Liaison to the Council of Students, Residents, and Fellows. I use she, her pronouns. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm excited about this program because it involves the collaborative efforts of student leaders from various oral health organizations, including the American Dental Education Association, the American Student Dental Association, the Society of American Indian Dentists, the Hispanic Dental Association, and, student national, and the Student National Dental Association. Today's student-led panel discussion features a panel of students who will share their lived experiences and varied pathways that led them to oral health education. But before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over a few housekeeping notes and features of this Zoom webinar platform. We'd love to hear from you throughout the presentation. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat area where you can post messages to other attendees of today's session. Feel free to use this area to say hello to your peers or comment throughout the webinar. We'll also have time at the end of the panel discussion for a Q&A with the moderators and panelists. So please submit any questions you have using the Q&A area. And lastly, this presentation is being recorded and will be placed on adia.org forward slash e-learn within a few business days. And now I'll turn it over to my co colleague, Curtis Bureau, who will share some important information regarding resources for those of you interested in an education and career in oral health. Curtis, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Dr. English. Um, welcome everyone, my name is Curtis Burrell and I'm the Senior Director of Recruitment and Outreach for Dental Education at ADEA. Um, I wanna to talk to you guys about all the cool things that ADEA has that can help you with your oral health profession pathway. Um, ADEA is your go-to place, go-to resource anywhere you are along the pathway. Um, if you leave from this conversation anything, GoDental.org is the place to go. Um, we have information to learn about the, the profession, the opportunities within the profession to fulfill your career goals, um, learn about the different curriculum of dental schools and dental programs, learn how to finance your dental education. Uh, we also have resources for you to explore the different schools and find the best fit, really figure out where you should be, where you wanna go, um, and what your next step's gonna be as you explore that pathway. Um, a couple other things, we have the official guide. If you're further along in the path, um, the official guide and the Dental School Explorer are really great resources. They're $35 worth every penny. Um, they're updated every two years and every participating school provides tons of information. It's a really great place for you to learn about the schools, more about what they have to offer holistically and not just the program, but also all the programs. Um, it's a really, really great resource. Um, we also have a couple really great events each year. And if you haven't already, register for the Go Dental Recruitment event, which is in New Orleans um, during your spring break on March 9th. Um, come down to New Orleans, hang out with us. We have over 60 dental schools there um, and, and a few other organizations and associations. So really great opportunity. We have a great morning planned with some of these similar great students to share their stories. Um, and we have some great resources for you as you navigate the application process, as well as just learning and meeting all the different admission staff and learning about the different schools. Um, that's uh, again, that is on March 9th and you can register at godental.org. Um, and then if you're more of a virtual person, we have a virtual um, a virtual fair with most, most of the dental schools, about 50 or 60 dental schools each year. Um, and that is on May 21st from three to six Eastern time. So we'll have more marketing for that later, but just put it on your calendar, mark the date, keep that afternoon free. Um, we have some other great resources as well online um, to really navigate and figure out what you wanna do with the profession maybe after dental school as well. So the different programs and pathways are there as well. Um, at this time, we're gonna do a quick poll. If I can ask Michaela to pull that up. So we'd like to learn a little bit about how you learned about um, the event today. If you could just fill this out. How'd you hear about us and which or which associations are you a member of? Um, you can click all that apply. Uh, we want to learn more about you and where you're coming from so we can do some really great programming and use this information in the future to make sure we reach you and, and share that information. So awesome. Well, I'm going to turn it over to um, Ashton and the, the real bulk and awesome part of this afternoon and evening um, and hear from the students. So thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Curtis. My name is Ashton Poole. I'm a third year dental student at the MUSC College of Dental Medicine. 
I have the pleasure of being you guys moderator for this highly anticipated webinar. Um, but before we, before we get started, I'd like to introduce my colleagues who will be participating on our student panel. So we have Tayana Davis. She's a senior at the Old Dominion University School of, Den School of, School of Hygiene. We have Chance Johnson. She's a second year dental student at Columbia University College of Dental Medicine. We have Adika Covido. She's a second year dental student at Rutgers School of Dental Medicine. We have Vicki Tran. She's a second year dental student at the University of California, San Francisco School of Den Dentistry. We have Rebecca Webster, um, a third year dental student at the Rutgers School of Dental Medicine. So we have a few questions that we will be going over with our panelists. And so without further ado, we'll get started with that, okay? First question I have here is for Tayana and Chance. So thinking back to when you applied to dental school um, or a live dental program, what advice do you have for students applying? Hello, everyone. Um, so the advice that I have um, when it comes to applying is to apply with confidence. I feel like a lot of us who apply um, usually don't have a background in dentistry. And if you do, that's great as well. But always apply with confidence and know that it's OK to reach out to the dental program that you're um, looking to apply to. Um, so, yeah, don't be afraid to reach out, ask questions that you have and stay organized as well, because most of the time they're asking for certain things such as certifications, um, maybe a short essay about yourself. So just know to be yourself and um, yeah, don't be afraid to reach out and ask certain questions. Yeah, just to build on that, because I kind of had a similar advice. I would say definitely to like be yourself and don't compare yourself to others. There's a lot of resources online that kind of become overwhelming when you're first looking at applying to dental school. You see people that are posting their volunteer hours, their shadowing hours, and you're like, how do I compare when I'm applying to dental school? Um, so just focusing on what your passions are and yeah, applying with confidence that you have like what it takes to go to like dental school, I think that's really important. And yeah, just being open-minded when you're considering programs as well. Yeah, great advice. Yeah, I definitely, you know, would um agree with you guys, you know, make sure you just stay, you know, it's your own journey. So make sure you just stay in your, you know, basically your own lane and just um don't compare yourself to others because it will distract you. But kind of just bouncing, bouncing off of that, um, just another question about just self-care. So how did you navigate taking care of yourself, like personal um, mental health and wellness while undergoing a rigorous application, you know, interview process for a dental school or a lot uh, program for admissions process? And this question goes to uh, Vicki and Rebecca, if you can elaborate on that. Uh, I can go. So. I applied during COVID, so it was actually kind of hard because, like, a lot of the time, it's not like I can just do things and, like, see people whenever, and so a lot of time, it was like, oh, I'm doing all these applications, I'm studying so much, but, you know, I can't be hanging out with my friends as much just to be conscious of, like, you know, what was going around me, but I think something that was important for, in terms of, like, taking care of my mental health is, like, you know, making a schedule that worked for me so that I had a balance between both doing things that I wanted to do and then also making sure I get my work done so like back then I'd be like okay I'm gonna start my work at like 4 p.m at the latest and then from 4 onwards I'm gonna grind but I have all this time in the morning and then a little bit in the afternoon to do what I wanted to do and then also like having extracurriculars that I really enjoyed and were healing or like um really like motivating to me helped my mental health because it, it wasn't feeling like I was forcing myself to do these activities. I was doing these activities because I cared about what they were doing and it brought me some sort of purpose or joy. Um, I definitely say the same thing. So the, the resource that I used to study um, for the DAT, um, it had program, like it had um, rest days in the schedule. And so when I saw that there was a rest day, I really did take a rest. So I would go and do activities I would um and it was during COVID as well so I was outside most of the time but um yeah I would I would just relax and have fun and not really think about it on those specific rest days but the other days I was on it um as well as I think it's really important to know yourself and um for me I knew that I needed to build rapport with a therapist and have like a community be around me before things got a little tough 
um, with the whole dental school application process because there are highs and lows. And so if you have a rapport with, you know, a friend, a confidant, a therapist, um, then you can go to them when you're going through it. So that really helped me. Exactly. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so for the uh, next question that we have, um, this will be tailored to uh, Adika and Chance. So um, what was important to you and how you decided on which dental school slash allied programs to apply to and ultimately attend? I'll go first. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so it's Etika. <laughs> Common mistake. No worries at all. But so I think that one of the most important things, and I feel like we can all relate, everybody on this panel um, kind of related when we were discussing these things, is that especially when you're a first generation dental student, whether you're going into dental health, dental education, dental hygiene, any of the allied programs is just kind of finding those resources. So I learned about so many after applying to dental school and that's how I got involved. And I think that's what we're trying to push here, right? So just in general, uh, my inspiration into exploring dental health fields began when I was 12 through my own experiences, just going through the whole process of dental health, getting braces, feeling very insecure with them, and then getting my smile back and feeling confident and just kind of realizing that's what I want to do for other people. And that kind of filled my um, curiosity to explore further. And as I grew up and I went to um, college, I kind of realized how much of a minority I really was. And it kind of just made me look at the um, the big gap in the healthcare field for dentistry, just kind of the representation of minorities and the lack of. And so that kind of pushed me to just close that gap and find others to do the same and hopefully be an inspiration to some people to also go for it, because um, that's not really something we may see for ourselves. OK. Um... We were talking about programs, correct? Or like what inspired us to go to dental school? Ashton, sorry, just to. Yeah, so basically, you know, um, what did you look at you know, the program that you attend now? Like what ultimately, you know, uh, made you make the decision to go there? Um. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a dentist since I was five. Um, I felt like college was really tough in terms of, doing a lot of the prerequisites. Um, I didn't feel super supported. So I ended up doing the summer health professions education program in my sophomore year of college. And um, that just kind of like opened my eyes in terms of like, this is something that I could really do. Um, it gave me experiences within like shadowing and hand skills. And then when I got into my master's program, um, because I just had a few times where I struggled within undergrad, I kind of did another program that kind of also solidified that for me. So I did a master's at Boston University in oral health sciences. So I was able to take the classes with the dental students and um, that kind of helped me apply to dental school. Yeah, to kind of elaborate off that, I definitely um, seeked out uh, programs before dental school. Um, UNC Chapel Hill has a um, program called MED. Um, at the time when I did apply, um, it was during COVID, but it, you know, uh, allowed me to have so much to talk about in my application. Um, and the experiences that, you know, I got from that was, uh, you know, undescribable. So, you know, definitely seek out, you know, programs that will help you kind of see if you want to take the route of whatever set program you want to go to. I definitely believe in summer programs. So, um, yeah, thank you guys for touching on that. Um, so the next question that we do have is for um, Vicky and Rebecca. All right. So how is dental school slash your live program different from your community college slash undergrad experiences? I will say that um, one major, well, there's two major things. The first major thing is that I'm actually interested in what I'm learning. Um, the, I would say the stakes are different. So in undergrad, I had a different mindset. I was studying just so that I could pass the test, get a good grade. But in dental school, you are learning this material so that you could be a better practitioner and so that you can give your patients the, the healthcare they deserve. And so that motivation kind of shifts how I view 
the material um, and it kind of brings it alive for me. And then secondly, um, like socially. So in undergrad, your friends probably had different majors. They ha- were, if they had the same major, they were probably taking different classes with different professors. Um, but in dental school, everybody, or at least the one I go to, everyone is taking the same class. We all have the same professors and we're all going through the same thing together. And so there's this, um, this base level of understanding that everyone has. And I feel like you can build off of that. um I agree with like what Rebecca said it's like you're an undergrad you have all these classes you don't really know what's like how they apply to you in your career and stuff but once you're in dental school you start realizing I was like oh like I should probably take this stuff seriously like do I want to be a good practitioner I really need to know what I'm doing like I need to know you know how to give proper technique you know make sure things look aesthetically pleasing like you can't um just like try to pass your way by it like you actually need to put in the work so in terms of like how my undergrad experience and dental school is I definitely went from like a larger like university I went to VCU for undergrad and now I'm here at UCSF and our class size is around uh, 60 80 um, including like international students so it's a lot more close-knit and everybody's working together especially since my school's pass fail like you really feel that camaraderie it's like oh we're all in this together we all want to be good dentists how can we both um like support each other throughout this like uh, journey yeah those are great points yeah I definitely agree um you know once you get into dental school for me personally I'm pretty sure you guys have the same experiences like you just said um with the material that we you know we receive and get taught it it's more we're able to study more you know study more and understand the information more now that we feel like you know we have to know the information to provide our you know for our patients and um strive for better oral health for our patients so in undergrad I know you know some of the classes that I took like organic chemistry stuff like that I'm just kind of like you know I'm not gonna be talking to my patients about you know uh, equations or something like that you know bouncing equations so um yeah definitely you know once you get into dental school the information that you're receiving you're you're studying kind of just is tailored differently um kind of starts to study more and hone into the information so I definitely feel like it's, it's a positive once you get to dental school or whatever a lot of program that you want to go to um so thank you guys for that for sharing that um so for our next question let's see we have for um Idika. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly at first um and Tayana so what role um do diversity equity inclusion and belonging play in your dental school slash a live program uh, curriculum training? So I think that's one of the biggest things um, personally at Rutgers that they jump into right away. The first class that we take to kind of ease into everything once you start dental school is um, kind of all about professionalism and just knowing um, things such as like patient autonomy, knowing that a patient has a choice in their own um, care, obviously, benefit, ben, beneficence, I always struggle with that word, which is basically doing things for the good for people, non-maleficence, doing things not to hurt them, X, Y, and Z. And so further into our curriculum, we do culture and communications. We actually have, which I'm sure other schools we have, is also kind of role-playing in different situations, people from different backgrounds, people who may need a translator, people who have been through um, certain cases of abuse and how to approach those things. So I think overall, all schools are trying to focus on the best ways for all of us to connect to our patients, because rather than just looking at their overall health, we also see them as a person. Um, So that's so important. And that's something that is very stressed, which is a really great thing that I know a lot of schools jump into. And what's so amazing is that I know that at Rutgers, our population pool is full of minorities. We are in an underserved area. So that's something we also stress. So it, it is a really big thing because at the end of the day, the patients that you're seeing now are a reflection of the real world and who you are going to see. So it is very integrated into your curriculum. It isn't just the books. It is also um, who you are going to be as a practitioner and how to approach these situations and actually have that um, professionalism and kind of that that intelligence, that IQ for um, interacting with other people. Yes, I would say that um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is something that's very important within my institution at ODU, Um, not only with our patients, but with the students as well. Um, I feel like we work together a lot with certain activities, 
that we do together just to kind of improve diversity and inclusion as well. Um, and as long as we're, our patient um, population is very diverse as, as well. So we also take um, courses to kind of educate us on what, you know, diversity is, um, how to deal with um, patients who um, don't speak English um, and along that lines as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I know you guys can attest to this as well that, you know, those that are in clinic already, you know, sometimes there's patients that will be driving maybe two hours, three hours away, just to attend your, your clinic. And some of those patients may be, you know, patients that may not speak English well or speak a different language. And um, I know at MUSC that do have like different services for the students to, you know, sign up for, to learn whatever language, you know, um, that you would like to attend. So I know I signed up for Spanish because a lot of my patients speak Spanish. And for me personally, I feel like, you know, I can provide the best care, um, you know, just even knowing just the basic terminology of dental terms, you know, in the, in the chair, the patient's going to feel comfortable knowing that you're putting the effort into learning, you know, their language. And, um, you know, they, they drive two hours, three hours away. So it's like, you know, you take, them, take the time out to, you know, meet them halfway to make them have a good experience. So um, I definitely feel like, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a big part in, you know, the student's perspective and also just, you know, on the patient um, side of things as well. So yeah, thank you guys for touching on that. That's a huge thing. So um, we will move on to our next question. So uh, this is for Vicky, and I'll touch on this question as well. So uh, for what oral health organization um, are you involved in? Or have you, excuse me, how did you get involved and how does your involvement help you while you're in dental school? So I guess like um, one of the big like oral health associations that I'm part of is the Student National Dental Association. So I would say I was really involved with it during my undergrad. So I was like, President and president elect for my USNDA chapter back at VCU. And then before coming into dental school, I was like, oh, like I saw that national SNDA had like applications. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to just go for it. I really like USNDA. I love SNDA. I love what they're going for. I care about DEI. Like those are things that make me happy. And those are things I'm passionate about. <clears throat> so that's how I got involved with it. And I'm also involved in my local chapter as well. So in terms of how it has helped me, it definitely has built like a community for me. And I've been able to meet such like amazing individuals across the countries and kind of get different perspectives about how different people approach their dental school. So since I'm like in California, it's definitely not what I'm used to. Like I was born and raised in Virginia. Those are the type of people that I'm used to. And then, you know, being in California, this is like a whole totally different like demographic of people that's you know, I'm still getting used to, but it's good to, like, I have SNDA. It's, like, a family I can rely on. It's been so, like, nice that it's, like, something I look forward to. So I think in terms of, like, oral health associations and stuff, that's what I'm really, like, involved in so far. Yeah, I totally agree. I joined uh, SNDA, um, which is a student national dental association, um, joining my first year. And uh, even before dental school, I was really big on just community service. And so um, that's a big part of uh, SNDA's mission is, you know, just giving back to the uh, underserved communities and providing, you know, uh, access to oral health, even it, whether there's just education or just resources. But um, just having, like you said, that community of like family to, you know, do that community service work with you just makes it a lot better than just doing it by yourself. You know, you have like minded pe people around you that um, wants to, you know, achieve a mission that you, you know, you want to achieve. So. Um, SNDA is definitely a valuable uh, organization to join. Um, if you, you know, even if you're not a minority, but for minorities within dental school, uh, you know, they accept everybody. <laughs> so um, yeah, it, you know, that's a good program that I definitely feel like has uh, positively you know, affected my journey within dental school. So, um, all right. So we'll move on to um, our next question. This is for Rebecca and Tayana. So um, for those of you in the clinic education portion of your journey, um, what have you learned about your patient care and interaction that students should be aware of? The number one thing for me is communication. Um, you need to know what you're doing and you need to know how to convey the risks, the benefits, the steps to a patient who has questions. and. Um, if things are unclear, then patient expectations will 
be nowhere near what you're doing, you know? So I think that being able to communicate what you're doing, being able to manage patient expectations um, and being able to educate in a way that makes them aware of what's going on and have, gives them the autonomy to choose which things they'd like to be, they would like done in their treatment plan. Um, that's something I really found important because it's one thing to just know what you're doing and, and know it for yourself, but being able to share that information with your patient um, adds a different level to it. And they will be more on board with the treatment plan when they know what's going on. Um, something I did want to touch on is like, I didn't know how vulnerable and open that patients would be with me. Um, so with that being said, I think that um, patient rapport is very important um, because your patients will literally tell you anything about their lives, their social lives. And I think it's important to tie that in um, when it comes to treating them as an individual with their treatment. Um, so yeah, I would also keep note of that and kind of appreciate that um, openness from them as well. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, there's, um, so I'm a third year student. So we start clinic in our third year and, um, you know, the journey that I've had so far and experiences I've had with my patients, you know, like you said, just sharing, you know, what you're doing or just, you know, informing them about oral health just goes a long way. So I have some patients that, or, you know, you have some people that sit down in the chair and then the operator just starts working on them. They don't know what's going on and they're kind of confused. They're like, you know, I would like to know what's going on if you're working my mouth, you know? So it's like, I try to put myself in their shoes and, you know, take the time out, even that's just like three minutes, you know, you'll be okay before your appointment to, you know, take five minutes out to talk to them and just explain, you know, hey, this is what we're doing today. And sometimes I even pull up pictures. I'm like, this is a bridge. This is a crown. Because sometimes they don't even know what that is to us. That's like very, you know, normal uh, ter terminology for us. So like taking time out to really explain what, you know, basic feeling is or something like that goes a long, long way. And like you said, they're able to accept the treatment plan that you present and it just makes that time period that you're treating them, you know, very enjoyable. So um, I definitely agree with you guys. So, you know, good points with that. Um, all right. So we have uh, two more questions here. Okay. This is for um, Attica. So what are career aspirations once you uh, graduate and why? So I think one of the biggest things that overall um, you guys should know, because obviously we're from different schools, is career aspirations can also kind of pivot off of your school, whether it's pass, fail, or rank. Um, but personally, Rutgers is rank. Love it. <laughs> but for me personally, one of the things is I don't, I'm not really thinking about um, specializing right now. And one of the misconceptions I had going into dental school is that your senior year, you had to apply and you had to match or else you wouldn't get a chance. And you would just have to be a general practitioner the rest of your life. However, through exploring different um, specialties, I actually did learn that you could go into a general practice and come back later, whether it's one year, two years, five years, 10. Um, so that's actually very encouraging. Feel free to get your experience and maybe you don't want to do one thing, you know, and focus on one thing for the rest of your career. And maybe you just want to kind of feel it out and then go back. So know that that's an option for right now. I do plan to do general. And what I kind of want to do is um, just enhance my own hand skills to feel comfortable to do those complex cases and not refer out. If I need to refer, I definitely will do so. But there are options um, that you will hear throughout dental school and through alumni and through kind of networking as well, such as um, the Pinky Institute in Orlando. Um, I believe it's Orlando, but I know it's in Florida. And that's something I learned through with an alumni at my school. And he kind of just advanced his hand skills. And it was just so inspiring to me to just know that there's more education rather than just maybe CE classes that give us knowledge, but also to be able to further those hand skills. I am currently a National Health Scholar, ah, National Health Service Corps scholarship recipient. So what that is, is um, basically it's a scholarship that you apply to, and it's really based on serving underserved communities. So they basically fund your schooling and then you work for them a number of years that they paid for school. So that can range anywhere two to four years. And so I'm very, very big on serving the underserved. So it's something that I wanna do now to be able to build my resources and build my connections in order to one day when I'm in a private office or owning my own office and I feel comfortable enough that I can work two, three days a week that I can offer my services to those underserved communities as well because I really think it is such a, um, big thing to give back. I'm not sure about, oh, I feel like I froze. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm not sure about specializing yet, but that's definitely my plan for now. 
congratulations on the scholarship. Yeah, that's a, a wonderful opportunity to, you know, be able to go back to the underscore community and provide services like that. Um, I'm very big on community service. So, you know, being able to do that is awesome. And also you just kind of get to take care of uh, school debt as well. <laughs> so it's a benefit as well with it. Um, okay, so our last question that we have here uh, for Rebecca, um, considering your dental uh your general school journey thus far, what is something that you've learned um, generally or about yourself that you did not know when you entered your school slash program? Oh, I learned so much. So um, I'm non-traditional. I went to school for engineering, did not like it. Uh, worked in a research lab for five years doing research, music, a bunch of other stuff. Um, and when it came time to start thinking about what I saw in my future, as and what I wanted to do with my life, um, I really had this epiphany. I mean, I'd, I'd heard about it before, but just your mindset. So in undergrad, I had a fixed mindset, whereas I'm good at these things and I'm not good at these things, so I'm gonna stick to what I'm good at. And um, I didn't really have the knowledge to understand that your mind is actually elastic and that you can build on the things that you are good at and not good at, and you can actually change and you can put more into that bucket of things that you're good at if you actually work hard and um, pour a lot of focus and energy into it. And so I think that's one thing that I did learn um, going back to school. It was very challenging and, and very a very scary task for me, but I had to keep in the forefront of my mind that I can do this. And um, another thing that I learned, um, and I say this all the time, but I'm not special. Like, I'm not special, you're not special. The pe if, so, if people in the grade above me can do this, then I can do it. There's nothing different about me that I can't do what the people ahead of me are doing. So keeping that in my mind really helped me kind of chip away at a lot of the barriers that I had put up after being out of school for so long. So that's really something I learned. Awesome, thank you for sharing that, Rebecca. All right, guys, so that wraps up our panel. Um, so thank you all for all of our panelists for that great discussion. So this kind of transitions to our next session, which is our Q&A. Um, we do have some questions that we already received from our audience, but I see that we do have some questions in the um, Q&A chat. So we'll go through these and also feel welcome to um, put a question in the Q&A box that it should be at the bottom of your screen um, if you have any questions as we run through the Q&A. So we'll kind of get started with our first question in the chat. Let's see here. So I have one that says, how many of your instructors instructors know your name? If anybody wants to unmute and answer that. I'll start. So Rutgers has a class size of about 90, um, but honestly it's very easy to get to know your professors and your professors to get to know you as long as you're putting that effort in. It's the same way in undergrad. Um, if you are asking for help, if you are making yourself known, you know. Um, one thing that I know a lot of undergrads struggle with is the um, letters of recommendation, especially in a large class. And I always say, even if you don't have a question, just make your face known, like show up to office hours. You know, um, it really is a kind of dual way because you need to understand that everybody wants to ask questions x y and d so uh, make it known and get yourself involved as well um one of the things that i do at school is that Rutgers has um a work study position that you're able to record the audio record lectures so that students who don't attend will be able to see them or students who need to revise and look over and hear again they can be able to do that and I think that's one of the positions that really helped me get to know my professors and them get to know me because I'm always going up, hi, my name is Etika. I'm the tech girl. Like, if you need anything, I'm here. Are we recording the lecture? X, Y, and Z. So that really helps um, getting involved in clubs as well. But I definitely think, once again, it's just a matter of you. Because um, trust me, I was very shy, but kind of just pushing out of that box and knowing that they want to help you as much as, you know, they um, as much as you want to get to know them. But it's also a matter of just kind of really realizing we are in a professional environment and we need to put um, kind of our foot down and kind of leading that conversation. Any other thoughts, comments? Okay, we'll move on to our next question. So were any of you non-traditional students um, before applying?
Um, I mean, yeah, I mentioned that a bit earlier. Um, in fact, I didn't, I didn't even realize I wanted to go into dentistry until um, a few months before the application opened. Um, but I, I, and this was during COVID, so I had a lot of downtime to think about my life and my choices, and um, and a lot of time to research. And so I'm, I'm so glad that I, I made that pivot. But yeah, it was non traditional um, engineering background. Wasn't a huge fan of it. Um, tried my hand at everything that I could, you know, get my hands on, and I landed on dentistry. Yeah, I kind of I took a gap year between my undergrad um, years of school to dental school, and um, definitely within that year, I did so much. Um, you know, went to the MED program. And, you know, like I said, everybody has their own journey. So don't base yourself off of uh, somebody else's journey because, you know, your journey is tailored to you and your experiences will, you know, make you unique when you apply to dental school. So don't be discouraged if you're on, you know, X amount of years of, you know, between undergrad and dental school. So you'll get there when you get there. <laughs> All right, guys. So um, our next question that we have here, uh, let's see. So for prereqs, pre uh, what sort of certifications would be beneficial to have for dental school applications? Personally, I didn't have any certificates going into dental school. I don't think that you necessarily need them or they're required. Um, doesn't mean they won't help. Like I know people get theirs in like x-ray. I think that's helpful for when you are going into dental school and you're going to be looking at a bunch of x-rays um but yeah no they're not required but they could be beneficial i know some people will get like um like a rda like registered dental assistant certification or you can actually get certified to take x-rays so like I know for VCU, VCU School of Dentistry, they have so, like some course you pay like $900 or something and then you get sort of, you take like a one day course and you're certified to take x-rays in the state of Virginia. So like little things like that. I didn't have it, but I know that's like some things like people would do. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, don't just go get certifications just to um do it, you know. I feel like at MUSC, they really want to see if you, you know, if your experiences matches up to why you want to pursue dentistry, you know, just don't get an extra certificate just because like, you know, I want to just make myself look better. Be able to elaborate on why you chose that, you know, specific uh, prereq or um, class or uh, certificate that, you know, you received because um, they, they will ask you. So make sure everything is intentional and, you know, you're doing it for the right reasons for experience. So I feel like experience weighs more than just getting certificates. Certificates are good, but experiences are good as well. <laughs> All right, guys. So uh, for our next question, um, for application. So as a sophomore in high school, what key steps should I take to make my application uh, to college more appealing, applying to pre-dental schools or as a pre-dental student? I mean, take full advantage, especially since you're a sophomore also. Take full advantage of what your school um, offers to you because if you have if you're able to get some AP college credits out the way, a lot of dental schools do take that. Some don't, and that's I guess something you can start looking towards now. I know it seems far, but just kind of what schools um, will take this versus won't take this because it could save you a lot of time. You could even graduate early, apply to dental school earlier, like take a gap year where it's not really a gap year because that would have been your fourth year in college anyways. Um, that's very common to do. But also just to get like a hands on, like ready experience of what to expect in college, like AP Chem, AP Bio, um, not necessarily AP Physics, but maybe like AP Statistics, AP Calculus. Those are things you can definitely um, get a hands on because that's something you also will see once you're in that um, t timeline of applying and taking the DAT, you're going to see there's a bio section, a chem section, an orgo section, a reading section. So maybe even like an AP Literature AP English um, type of class. And I think, honestly, it's never too early to start shadowing. If you want to start shadowing different offices, ortho, pediatrics, general dentistry. Um, but the number one thing, um, as you know, you have schools that are known for pre-dental, pre-med. Um, but overall, I think it's important 
get your sciences really just to go to college. And then once you're in college, that's when you really get your hands on to kind of create that applicant, like that applicant, that applicant that you want to be for dental school. I've done this. I've done that. So don't stress too much about it now is what I'm telling you. But if you want to head start, go ahead because it's never too early. And you could even talk about that when you are applying to dental school to kind of show you have those roots and that foundation of this is what I wanted to do. And I started early to show that. Great advice. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, so the next question that we have here, um, let's see. What types of factors did you consider when looking at colleges that would help you prepare for uh, dental school? So I guess, like, you know, just kind of elaborate on this question, just see if they, you know, what they really mean is um, what about your undergrad did you kind of seek out that you thought, you know, would help provide, you know, um, a better journey to apply to dental school? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I can't speak specifically to undergrad, but I know, um, in my time after undergrad, I I did a lot of um, more artistically inclined things. So I decided to go into jewelry making. Um, I painted, I still paint. Um, and I just sort of followed wherever my heart wanted me to go, especially when it came to hands-on things, but it, because I feel like a lot of dental schools are looking for people who are not only you know, book smart, but actually can't, or, you know, have dexterity and they know what they're doing with their hands. So um, definitely finding a hobby or something that's more hands-on, like knitting or something, I, I feel like that could be beneficial and fun. Let's see. Um, we have some more questions here. All right, so um, how are your clinical instructors for those that are in clinic? And um, can you share a little bit more about your interactions or learning experiences with them? Um, I will say um, my instructors, they're amazing, by the way, at ODU. Um, I, I would say um, they're all individuals. They're all different. Um, and I think the most important thing is learning how to work with everybody as their individual self um, and just being understanding that they're humans, too. I think sometimes as students, we can forget that. Um, but, yeah, I just want to say that it's it's good working with them for sure. And you should always be open to them um, because they care. Yeah, I can attest to that. Like at MUSC, we have um, for those that are in clinic. Um, we have a, a doctor that we are paired with. And before we even start to present the treatment plan to the patient, we're sitting down with that doctor who is our preceptor is what it's called. And uh, we're able to discuss the treatment, you know, the patient's health history, all that stuff. And um, this is just a good bonding moment, you know, as a mentor and a mentee type way. So um, I don't know if other schools do that, but I feel like that's pretty valuable, you know, going into the clinic and as a, a student and treating patients. So, um, and that aspect of, you know, interacting with my clinical professors, that definitely is a, a positive at MUSC. Um, okay, so we'll move on to our next question. Um, what would be one thing or resource that dental school slash a lot of faculty and administration should know about their students in order to support support them? I think at the end of the day, everybody has different backgrounds. Um, even though you have your certain um, like clinical doctors that are overviewing or even in your preclinic um, era, so your first two years, it doesn't, necessar it doesn't necessarily mean they went to that school for dental school. Um, they may have come from somewhere else. Um, and I think it's just important to talk to them and be like, what was your experience? And maybe you can even ask them, um, why did you choose this school? And what are the things that you feel helped you um, 
get to where you are in your clinical skills or why you felt that working in also a dental school was the right way to go for your career. So I don't think there's any set level of you need to know about this or this professor knows about this. Once again, I talked to an alumni earlier, like I mentioned, from the Pinky Institute, um, which is in Florida. And I know there's also somebody else who a doctor that I very briefly gave a presentation. She is one of the faculty at my school that mentioned um, a furthering education um, school that she also went to. So I think it's just a matter of asking them, but I don't think there's any set rule of something that everybody knows and they will um, share. I think it's just a matter of just kind of expressing that interest. All right, thank you for that. Um, we'll move on to our next question. So. Um, how did you prepare for dental school interviews and what suggestions do you have based on your experiences? Yeah, I could speak a little bit about this. Um, in terms of preparation, so I would do research on each of the schools that I was interviewing for and look at things that I liked. Um, and I wrote them down in like my notes app on my iPhone and then there are like so many resources out there about questions that potential schools might ask, the type of schools. Um, so I kind of practiced those a lot. Like in the shower, I made sure I had my like kind of 30 second pitch of like, who was I? Like if they asked me, like, tell me about yourself, then I knew off the bat, like what I was kind of about to say and where I wanted the conversation to go within my interviews. Um so yeah, just like a lot of practice, there's documents like online. I know UPenn had like a dental question thing that I like basically filled out. And then yeah, researching the school is really important to just kind of get a sense of like what you like and what you will probably ask on an interview to your interview. I will definitely say a lot of practice. And for me, it was like really hard to talk about these things like I kind of froze up a lot but then like you know I went to a lot of like career center sessions like if your undergrad has like a career services or something they have a lot of people who will help like do mock interviews and then also typing out like the story that I wanted to tell like getting an idea of it like some people are able to like talk about these things on the fly for me it's like I need to really like think about it what details I want to bring up and then how I want to deliver it so yeah lots and lots of practice Yeah, I totally agree. You know, you want to have those basic questions of like, you know, why uh, dentistry um, kind of, you know, in the forefront of your mind. You don't want to sound like a robot, but you just kind of want to just have those you know, key highlights that you want to hit within your interview. Um, and it definitely goes around a long way. And I just want to see if you're conversational, you know, if you can hold a conversation, because this is exactly what we do. We're in the uh, dental clinic is hold a conversation with our patients. You know, they don't want to, you know, have somebody in school that, you know, can't hold a conversation or um, can't describe whatever treatment plan it is, or just, you know, be a human to somebody else. <laughs> so um, definitely just practice on just being yourself if you have an interview. And like I said, just have those basic questions, just down pack and just make it conversational. Okay, so uh, we'll hit another question here. Um, for Tayana, um, can you share more about students, uh, student events and things you all do for diversity, inclusion, and sense of belonging? And to follow up with that question, how can other schools implement uh, similar events? So one of the committees that's actually implemented into my um, school is called the Well Ideas Committee. Um, and within this committee, we help come up with activities and events and events such as um, the uh, cultural celebration event. And this is where we get together as students and we kind of, uh, we share things within our culture such as food, like everybody has a chance to bring um, their favorite dishes that they like to make within their culture and kind of express those feelings with each other as well. Um, and then we also do like wellness ideas as well. Um, so like for instance, this month, um, we have an exercise challenge kind of going around just to kind of help promote exercising because, you know, we all know that being in dental school or dental hygiene school can be stressful. So we kind of um, implement those things to help deal and cope with those, with the stress that comes along with it. Um, what else? Um, Within our clinic, we have um, like videos on our website 
um, place for um, patients with autism and in general um, helps the, our patients like locate our office and become familiar with it so that way they're less stressed um, when they come for their appointment. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different things that we do, um, including the curriculum. Um, we just sort of talk about diversity and um, culture and, you know, how to be respectful of everybody's culture as well, because that's also very important to learn. Um, but yeah, those are some of the events that we do have planned and I hope we'll continue. That's pretty cool. Thanks for sharing that. All right, guys, for our last question, um, we try to get, you know, at least two to three responses from this question. So how many of you are interested or slash considering an academic career? Um, if not, why? I personally was considering an academic career uh, here at Columbia. We actually have the opportunity to do a dual degree with Teachers College of Columbia. Um, so that was like kind of what kind of sparked my inspiration for going into academics. Um, also, just to see more people like me within the field of dentistry, there are a lot of professors like once you get higher up that um, are majority white. So I kind of am more inspired to do academics because of that. I agree with Chance completely. Um, I know up in clinic, we have one Hispanic uh, faculty member and I remember meeting her and I was just like fangirling and I was like, oh my God, amazing. But I think one of the coolest things about teaching academically is kind of just not only being that representation for those students coming in, but I feel like it's a way to keep learning yourself. Dentistry is always changing and it's just amazing to be able to learn those things with the students as well. So you stay a student as well and kind of just being able to help people little by little. Maybe there are some things you'll go through in your own um, under like pre-dental careers or dental student careers that you'll see that, you know what, like this is a change that I want to see. Maybe I can be that professor, that faculty member to help change this. You know, like if you feel like there's just an atmosphere or certain environment that you feel like, you know what, I think this would help students better. Maybe you can help implement that and kind of just like plant that seed. So I think that would be really cool. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I know here at MUSC and probably at your school as well, you know, even if you don't want to be a full-time faculty member, uh, we have people in the clinic attendings or doctors that, you know, have graduated that comes back on certain days and uh, are able to be in the clinic and provide, you know, their insight, you know, on the clinical side. And in that way, you can, you know, start to see people that, you know, look like you as well. Um, so that's a good opportunity to seek out, even if you don't want to be, you know, a full-time faculty member. But um, both sides are great. It just depends on, you know, what's tailored to you and what you would like to do. So that looks like that is all the questions that we are able to get through today. So I want to um, thank the panelists for taking time out to share your wisdom and insight. You guys dropped a lot of golden gems. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's also been a pleasure of working with you all to set up this great webinar. Um, and I hope that uh, everyone in our audience learned something today and can take with you through your journey to applying to whatever program you're applying to. Um, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. English for closing announcements. Thank you so much, Ashton and panelists. We really appreciate all that you shared. And a special thank you to the senior leaders, staff, and students at the American Dental Education Association, the American Student Dental Association, the Society of American Indian Dentists, the Hispanic Dental Association, and the Student National Dental Association for supporting and collaborating to bring this webinar together today. And on behalf of Adia, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today. Although we could not get to everyone's questions, you all asked a lot of amazing questions. Remember, you can also visit the Go Dental website for more pre-dental information, and that will be placed in the chat. And in just a moment, a link to a post-event survey will appear in your browser window requesting your feedback. If you missed it for any reason, you can also find the survey on the course page on adia.org forward slash elearn or in the chat. Please take a moment to complete this survey as it helps us to plan future web events. And as a reminder, a recording of this event will be available at adia.org forward slash elearn within a few business days. This concludes our webinar. We hope that you can join us for future events, including our in-person event, the 2024 ADIA Annual Session and Exhibition and the Go Dental event 
in New Orleans, Louisiana, March 9th through the 12th. Thank you everyone and have a great day.